Welcome to our study of the Gospel according to Mark. This is a work of the Metaview Church of Christ in Mesquite, Texas. And now, here is Mike Heisel with today's lesson. Welcome to our Bible study. I appreciate you for joining me today as we are studying through the Gospel according to Mark. Last week we left off in Mark chapter 3, so please go ahead and open your Bibles to that passage. And we were noting specifically a passage that's found in verses 13 through 19 in which Jesus chose his 12 apostles. And so let's read that passage, make a few preliminary comments, and then we'll pick up where we left off last week. Mark writes, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now last week we commented on the meaning of the term apostle. It means one sent out. But I didn't talk about the different ways in which that term apostle is used in the New Testament. In fact, it's used in four senses in the New Testament. First of all, the New Testament talks about what we might call the apostle from heaven. Consider Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. There the Hebrews writer says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. So Jesus is our apostle. Well, in what sense is he an apostle? In what sense is he sent? Well, I think 1 John 4 and verse 14 helps us understand the sense in which Jesus is our apostle. 1 John 4, 14 says, And we have seen, now this is of course the apostle John, who was an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So Jesus is an apostle from heaven in the sense that the Father sent him from heaven to earth to save us from our sins. A second way in which the New Testament uses the word apostle is with reference to false apostles. Uh, Consider, for instance, Revelation 2. Revelation 2. And we want to look at verse 2. So Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus. He's sending them a letter, as we noted in the sermons uh, this past Sunday and the Sunday before that Jesus sent letters to the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia. Well, Jesus commends the church in Ephesus in the following way. Revelation 2, verse 2. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false, have found them liars. Uh, You see this also in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 13 to 15 where uh, Paul refers to uh, some individuals who actually have been sent by Satan. He refers to them as false apostles. And of course all one has to do is turn on Trinity Broadcasting Network and see the various people who claim to be apostles today uh, preaching things that you don't find in the New Testament as examples of false apostles. A second category of apostle is what we might call apostles of the church. Consider, for instance, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8, and we want to look at verse 23. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 23. Paul, as he's uh, talking about this contribution that he's taking up among the Gentile churches and that is being sent by the Gentile churches to the poor uh, Christians who are in the Jerusalem church, here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 8.23, As for Titus, he's my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are, now the NIV says, representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. 
Well, literally, they are apostles of the churches. These individuals have been selected from among the various churches that have made this contribution to the poor saints in Jerusalem. They've been selected to carry that contribution to the poor saints who are in Jerusalem. So they have been sent from the churches on this mission, this benevolent mission. So in that sense, they're apostles of the churches. Uh, and, uh, well, I won't even... I did end up spending too much time if I commented on a controversial passage in Romans 16, verse 7, but, but that's the idea. So there are apostles of churches. And in this sense, you still could have apostles today. You know, anytime, for instance, um, a group from Metaview carries contributions that we've made from Metaview to Foster's Children's Home, those individuals whom we send with that contribution, they're apostles of Metaview. They've been sent forth by Metaview on that mission. But then the fourth category is the category that we're studying about in Mark chapter 3. These are the apostles of Christ. And uh, these are uniquely empowered individuals who uh, serve as Jesus' representatives to establish the church. Uh, it's upon these individuals and their testimony that the church is built. Consider Ephesians 2 and verse 20. Ephesians 2 and verse 20. Here Paul says that we as the church are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So they are in uh, the foundation of the church. Their word is still found in scripture. You know, books made it into the New Testament on the basis of whether or not they were written by an apostle or by someone closely associated with and approved of by an apostle. So uh, there are no new apostles of Christ. Now, as long as uh, the world stands, there will continue to be apostles of churches. Local churches will send out representatives to fulfill their work. But apostles of Christ, the apostles of Christ that Jesus chose in the beginning are the apostles who will be uh, the apostles of Christ throughout the Christian age. All right, so back to uh, Mark chapter 3. So we made the point last week that we have uh, the list of the apostles in four places in the New Testament. It's found in Matthew 10. It's found in Luke 6, it's found in Acts 1, and it's found right here in Mark chapter 3. And we pointed out that uh, this list of 12 men uh, is divided up into three sets of four men. And uh, every time this list occurs, you know, in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke and in Acts, you find the same men in each of these three sets. The same four men in each of the three sets. Now, uh, the order is often changed. Now, Peter always heads the list, and uh, it's always the case that Philip heads the uh, second set of four men, and it's always the case that Simon, son of Alphaeus, uh, heads the uh, third set of four apostles. And, you know, it, it's always in that same order. In other words, the first four are always the first four, the second four are always the second four, and the third four are always the third four. But within the list themselves, you know, within that set of first four and that set of second four and that set of third four, with the exception of the same names always heading the sets, uh, the order can be different. Though whenever Judas is mentioned, and Judas is not mentioned in Acts because uh, that is in the list in Acts because by that time Judas has already betrayed the Lord and he's already hung himself and so he's no longer an apostle. And in fact, in Acts chapter 1 where the list of the apostles occurs, a successor is chosen for Judas. But uh, in Matthew 10 and in Mark 3 and in Luke 6, Judas always uh, is the last name on the list and obviously it's because he betrayed the Lord. Now, last week, we noted that uh, first set of four men. We noted uh, Simon, and we noted James, and John, and Andrew. And, and by the way, just, just a few words about that. The name Simon is a very common name in the New Testament. In fact, it is the most common name for a Jewish man in the New Testament. 
nine different individuals in the New Testament are named Simon. And so, of course, the apostle, in order to differentiate uh, him from all the other Simons, uh, he's called Simon Peter. Jesus gave him the nickname Peter, a rock. Uh, the name James is also a very common name for Jewish men in the New Testament. There are six uh, different men who are named James in the New Testament. Now, of course, the name Simon is a form of Simeon. And so uh, Simon, Simon Peter, you know, was named Simon, of course, after the Simeon, uh, who was one of Jacob's 12 sons. And, and the name uh, James, we pointed this out, I think it was last week, but maybe it wasn't last week, whenever it was, we noted the fact that, that the name James is a form of the Old Testament name Jacob. It's just the Greek form of the Old Testament name Jacob. And, and actually, as I said, I have no idea why English translations began to translate uh, the name Iacobos, uh as, uh, as James. Anyway, there, there's got to be some reason. I just don't know why. But anyway, uh, there are six different individuals with that name James. And again, it's after the Old Testament patriarch Jacob. And then the name uh, John, that's a common name in the New Testament. Uh, it occurs uh, five times. That, that, not five times, but five different men, I should say, are called John in the New Testament. Of course, the most well-known we know of is, is John the Baptist, but actually the author of this second gospel account, Mark. Uh, his name was also John. You see that in the book of Acts. His name was John Mark. And the name John means that the Lord is gracious. But then the name Andrew, uh, this is the only man named Andrew in the New Testament. Uh, it was common among uh, Greek-speaking people. And actually the name Andrew, it, it's just a form of the Greek word for man, the, the, the word on air, and so that's what Andrew means. It just means man. All right, but now let's, let's begin this second set of uh, four apostles. So the first name, and, and again, this is always the first name. Uh, each of the four times the list of the apostles are given, this is always the first name in that second set of four apostles. And the name is Philip. Now, now, there are actually four men in the New Testament who are referred to as Philip. A couple of uh, Herod the Great's sons are also referred to as Philip. And then, of course, uh, one of the uh, first, uh, we might call him a deacon in the church. There's some dispute whether or not he was a deacon, but, uh, you know, the one chosen in Acts chapter 6 along with Stephen to take care of the uh, daily uh, benevolent gift to uh, the uh, Greek-speaking Jewish widows in Acts 6, and you know he's the one who preached in Samaria and also uh, preached the gospel to the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. He's the one that had the four virgin daughters who prophesied, and I've just given you way too much information about him because we need to focus on the apostles. But, but the point is, you know, Philip is a relatively common name for men in the New Testament. And just an interesting note about the name Philip. Uh, you know, last week we noted what the name Philadelphia means. You know, we noted that it comes from two Greek words, philos and autophos, philos meaning love. Well, actually the name Philip comes from two Greek words, one of which is also philos, love. But you want to guess what the second Greek word is? It's hippos. Uh, you know, of course you would recognize the name hippos from hippopotamus. Uh, hippos just means horse. So the name Philip means horse lover. <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, interesting. But uh, at any rate, this man Philip is mentioned four other places in the New Testament, that is, outside of the lists of the apostles. And all four of those places are in John's Gospel account. You know, I might just uh, show us those four occurrences, and we'll run through them really quickly. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I'm going to say a little bit more uh, in terms of what we know about these uh, last eight apostles than what I did about the first four apostles because we're much more familiar with uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John than what we are with the rest. So that's the reason why I'm doing this. But uh, John chapter 1 is the first uh, mention of uh, Philip in uh, the book of John. 
So John 1.43 says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. So Jesus sought Philip out and told Philip to become a follower of his. Verse 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, now those are the two apostles also, was from the town of Bethsaida. So uh, Bethsaida, remember, is the town on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So uh, apparently Philip knew Andrew and Peter before they were called to be apostles. Well, Philip, after he was called by Jesus to be an apostle, we're told, verse 45, found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth. Can anything good come from there, Nathanael asked? Come and see, said Philip. So, some interesting things we learn about Philip. Philip is a student of Scripture. Uh, he's, he's read Moses. He's read the prophets. Uh, he's someone who has been looking out for Messiah. And uh, he's not just interested in Messiah for his own sake. He's interested in others. He's interested in his friend, Nathaniel. Now, keep this in mind because Nathaniel is going to uh, play into comments we make about later apostles here in, uh, in Mark's list in Mark chapter 3. Okay, the second reference to Philip in John's gospel account comes in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And in John 6, Jesus is preparing to feed the 5,000. Now, we know that the feeding of the 5,000 from Luke's account, Luke chapter 9, happened in the area around Bethsaida. Well, that's where Philip is from. And so Jesus goes to Philip and he says, Mark, or excuse me, John 6 verse 5, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread? for these people to eat. Now I asked Philip because Philip's from Bethsaida. Verse 6, he asked this only to test him for he, he already had in mind what he was going to do. So, so he's testing Philip. Well, Philip, you know, give me, uh, or give him the, the uh, name of a few uh, local bakeries where they can buy bread or will Philip acknowledge the fact that Jesus as Messiah has the power uh, to miraculously create bread for this multitude in the wilderness, just like God uh, provided manna for the Israelite multitude in the desert. And so verse 7, Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <laughs> so Philip fails the test, all right? Now look at John 12. That's the third occurrence of Philip's name in John's Gospel account. John chapter 12, and let's pick up in verse 20. John 12, verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. So this is the Jewish festival in Jerusalem, but some uh, Greek people who are not Jews, but they're God-fearers, they've come to worship also at the festival. Verse 21. They came to Philip. Now, why would they come to Philip? Well, maybe they came to Philip because Philip is from Galilee, and Galilee is Galilee of the Gentiles. Maybe these particular uh, Gentiles have known Philip from the time when you know he was growing up in the city of Bethsaida. Don't know. But at any rate, they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Now remember, Andrew, we know from John chapter 1, was also from Bethsaida. So Philip and Andrew and Peter probably have a relationship going way back. So Philip went to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. All right, so that's the third reference. And then the fourth reference to Philip comes in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And in John 14, after... Uh, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And he says, if you really knew me, uh, you would know my Father as well, etc. Well, Philip says to him, John 14, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And notice Jesus' reply. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? 
And of course, Jesus Christ was sent from the Father. Jesus Christ was God incarnate. Uh, when Jesus spoke, it was the Father speaking through him. When Jesus acted by way of, of uh, performing a miracle, etc., it was the Father performing the miracle through him. To see Jesus is to see the Father. There's such a close connection between Jesus and the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one, John chapter 10 and verse 30. And so Jesus, uh, you know, is, is uh, really um, uh, losing his patience, if you will, with Philip. Very, uh, I'm searching for the right word, <laughs> very discouraged with Philip's lack of faith at this point in time. But that's all the references that we have you know, outside of the list of the apostles to Philip in the New Testament. All right, back to uh, Mark chapter 3. Mark 3, and let's notice the next name. So Mark 3 verse 18, after Philip comes the name Bartholomew. Now this is interesting. The name Bartholomew uh, does not occur uh, outside of the lists of the apostles. But it is interesting, every time the name Bartholomew occurs, except, uh, that is in the list, except in the list found in Acts chapter 1, it always follows Philip. So there's seemingly this close connection between Philip and Bartholomew. Now, what does the name Bartholomew mean? Well, the name Bartholomew literally means son of Talmai. Son of Talmai. You say, well, where do you get that? Well, notice it says bar Tholomew. And bar in the Aramaic language meant son of. So bar Tholomew is a way of saying son of Talmai. Uh, you see this later in Mark's account. Now this is significant. I'm not just saying this just to be saying this. It's significant. Uh, sometimes I say stuff just to say stuff, but, but this time I'm actually saying something that's significant. Uh, okay, look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, and look, if you will, in verse 46. Mark 10, 46. When they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus. Now, do you notice that? Bartimaeus. That's his name, but Bartimaeus. Now, Mark is going to define what that means. Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus. The bar means son of. So in the same way Bartholomew means son of Ptolemy, Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. Now, <clears throat> maybe we're most familiar with this, that is those who are King James Version readers, from uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, where after uh, Jesus... Uh, uh, was confessed by Peter, Jesus in turn confesses Peter and he says, Blessed are you, Simon. Now the King James translates it, Son of Jonah. Uh, excuse me, that's not how the King James translates it. The King James translates it, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah. Now, more modern translations will go ahead and translate that rather than just giving a strict transliteration. And so rather than saying bar Jonah, they'll say, Son of of Jonah. But Bar Jonah is what the Greek text actually says. But, but at any rate, Bar means son of. So, so Bartholomew means son of Talmai. You could call, you could call Simon Peter Bar Jonah. Bar Jonah. So, so this may be a nickname. And so in light of those two facts, the two things that I've mentioned, that Bartholomew is associated with Philip, comes right after Philip, in three of the four lists of apostles, and number two, in light of the fact that Bartholomew seems an awful lot like a nickname, son of Ptolemy. Uh, it may very well be the case, and many people believe that it's the case, that this Bartholomew is actually the, the Nathaniel that we read about. You remember John chapter 1? As we were studying about Philip, in John chapter 1, after Jesus sought Philip out, what did Philip do? Philip, we're told, John chapter 1 and verse 45, found Nathanael and said, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
And uh, Nathaniel's response, and again, this may be Bartholomew, Nathaniel's response was, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked, come and see, Philip said. Verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom is no deceit. So he acknowledges the worthiness of Nathaniel. In verse 48, Nathaniel replied, How do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you when you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. So, you know, he, he shows that he's a prophet by making reference to this incident. Here's Philip under a fig tree. And by the way, uh, <clears throat> There may be some real significance to that in light of some Old Testament prophecies concerning the nature of the Messianic kingdom. I don't have time to pursue those, but, uh, but well, and I'm, I'm not going to say any more. But there may be some significance to that. Verse uh, 49, Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. You see, Jesus, knowing something about Nathanael that he couldn't have known aside from some sort of divine revelation, Nathanael declares Jesus to be the Son of God. You know, you're the promised King of Israel. Verse 50, Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, of course, the reference is made to uh, Jacob's experience in uh, Bethel. You remember whenever uh, he had a pillow for a stone when he's fleeing from his brother Esau and in a dream at night he had this vision of heaven opened and this great staircase and uh, God standing at the top of the staircase and the angels of God going up and down on the staircase. Uh, and anyway, it caused him to declare that place to be the house of God, the gate of heaven, hence Bethel. Uh, Beth, house, El, God, Bethel, house of God. But at any rate, this, this Nathaniel may very well be Bartholomew. Now again, his name would be Nathaniel. When he was born, uh, his father, Talmai, gave him the name Nathaniel. But then, he's known as uh, Bartholomew, son of Talmai, to distinguish him from other Nathaniels. All right? but, but at any rate, that's the only reference to him that we have in the New Testament is there in John 1 and also in the... Uh, oh, no, wait, wait. There's one more. I almost forgot. There's one more. We know where he came from. Uh, excuse me. I almost forgot. Look at John 21. John 21. <clears throat> so John 21 uh, records for us the third appearance of Jesus to his apostles after his resurrection. And we're told, verse 1, I'll just start in verse 1. Verse 2 is what we're looking for, but, but I'll start in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Si uh, uh, Simon Peter, Thomas, also uh, known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. Now again, if Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same, then we know that he grew up in Cana of the Galilee. So, uh, you know, he's a faithful Israelite in whom there is no guile. His father's name is Talmai, and he grew up in Cana in Galilee, where Jesus also performed the first miracle, turning of the water to wine <clears throat> at the wedding feast. Okay, so back to uh, Mark chapter 3. And let's notice uh, another apostle here. So uh, the third apostle in this second set of four apostles in verse 18 is Matthew. Now, Matthew is not mentioned anywhere else in uh, Mark's gospel account, by name, that is, explicitly by name. But uh, you remember what we studied about back in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2 and at verse 14, we're told that, as Jesus walked along, uh, <clears throat> he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, who is this Levi, son of Alphaeus? Well, we know who the Levi, son of Alphaeus is because of the parallel account in Matthew's gospel account. In Matthew chapter 9, and at verse uh, 9, we're told this, As Jesus went on from there, 
he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, in Mark's account, Mark 2, verse 14, it's Levi, son of Alphaeus, who's sitting at the tax collector's booth. But in Matthew's account, Matthew 9, 9, it's Matthew. It's the one called Matthew. And so, uh, Levi is Matthew. Matthew is Levi. And interestingly enough, Mark expected his readers to know that. Because the one that's called Levi, son of Alphaeus in Mark 2.14 is called Matthew in Mark, Mark 3.18 without any word of explanation. So Mark expected his readers to understand this. So you know, as we pointed out, the name Levi uh, <clears throat> is the name of uh, one of Jacob's sons. You remember the third son of Jacob through his wife Leah was named Levi. The tribe of the Levites was named after this man Levi. Right, and his father's name was Alphaeus. Now, we talked about this when we were studying Mark 2. I think that there's a good case to be made that the name that Alphaeus gave his son at birth was the name Levi, but Jesus is the one who called Levi Matthew because in, in the Greek, the construction uh, in, Mark, in Matthew 9.9 9, that he saw a man named Matthew is a very similar construction to the fact that Simon was named Peter or called Peter in a passage like Matthew 10 and verse 2. So the name Matthew means gift of God. So it may very well have been the case then that Jesus, you know, in calling this tax collector to follow him, uh, also gave him this, this nickname, uh, the nickname being Matthew. And of course, uh, Matthew is a gift of God to us because Matthew is the one who wrote the first gospel account. And I tell you, as much as I love Mark, uh, Matthew, uh, we just couldn't do without Matthew because, uh, you know, it's in Matthew that we get uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. My, how uh, our Christian lives would not be as rich without uh, a knowledge of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And so Matthew truly has been a gift of God to the church uh, by his gospel account. Okay, so <clears throat> the, uh, the fourth name in this second set of four apostles, Mark chapter 2 and verse 18. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll have more to say about Matthew in just a moment, so, so keep Matthew in mind. But the fourth name is the name uh, Thomas. And of course, we're all familiar with Thomas. Now, uh, something that you may not know about Thomas is uh, the fact that the name Thomas means twin. And uh, actually, that the meaning of that name Thomas as twin uh, is given in the Greek in John's account. You know, for instance, look at John chapter 11. So Thomas uh, occurs in, um, what is it, three places in John's gospel account, four places in John's gospel account. Look at John chapter 11 and look at verse 16. John 11 verse 16. Then Thomas also known as Didymus, right? So, so Didymus is the Greek word for twin, and Didymus, or twin, is what the name Thomas means. So in uh, Aramaic-speaking circles, he's known as Thomas. In Greek-speaking circles, you know, he's known as Didymus. So, you know, something very significant uh, we can glean about him from that fact that his name means twin. He probably was a twin. <laughs> now, we don't know who his brother was, but it's probably the case that, uh, that uh, Thomas was a twin. You know, of course, we have some other notable twins in Scripture, like uh, Jacob and Esau. They were twins, according to Genesis chapter 25. So actually here in John 11, which we don't know about Thomas outside of the list of the apostles, outside of John's gospel account. Again, John tells us more about Thomas than the rest of the New Testament does, just like John tells us more about Philip than the rest of the New Testament does. And John tells us more about Bartholomew than the rest of the New Testament does. So in John 11 and verse 16 is Jesus, you know, he's, um, uh, the Jews have been seeking his life in Jerusalem. And so, so he flees because his hour for crucifixion hasn't yet come. And he gets word that Lazarus, his friend, has died. And so the sisters, Martha and Mary, asked Jesus to come back. 
And uh, so Jesus, after receiving word that Lazarus has died, you know, he stays where he is on the other side of Jordan for a few days, and then he decides to go back. But again, people have been seeking his life. And so here's what Thomas says, John 11, verse 16, Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Now that tells you a little bit about something, a little something about Thomas, doesn't it? It lets us know about how brave of a man Thomas was. But then we learn more about him in uh, John chapter uh, 14. All right, the second reference to Thomas. After Jesus makes that uh, well-known statement, uh, you know, that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also, you know, in John uh, 14 verses 1 to 4. Thomas responds to that. Now this time, not so well. Thomas responds to Jesus' statement by saying, John 14, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, we've said it, I think, a few times in uh, our study of Mark. The Jews had a misconception concerning the nature of the Messianic kingdom. They're expecting the Messianic kingdom to be a political earthly kingdom. They're expecting Messiah to come and to be this this earthly uh, king from David's family who will lead the Jews in a fight against the Romans and restore to the Jews and the city of Jerusalem political independence. That's what they're expecting. And Jesus isn't that sort of a Messiah. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, one that he would establish by dying on a cross, you know, not defeating the Romans in battle initially, but he would allow the Romans to defeat him, to crucify him, but then he was resurrected and ascended to heaven and sat on David's throne in heaven, not in Jerusalem, and established a spiritual kingdom. Now, there's going to be uh, a universal component to that at his second coming, but not at his first coming. And so so Thomas is still buying into that false notion of kingdom. And so when Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, Thomas, he's just confused. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Because he just can't conceive of Messiah dying and leaving earth and going to heaven. Messiah is supposed to stay on earth. He's supposed to defeat the Romans and rule forever in Jerusalem. So he's confused. So this is a not so good statement from Thomas. But then the third reference to Thomas is the one we know best, and that's in John 20. After Jesus' uh, resurrection, he appeared on that first Lord's Day to the apostles as they were gathered together, but Thomas wasn't there. And so in John 20, and uh, at verse 24, uh, we're told, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, you know, twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So that's why he's known as Doubting Thomas. Now, now keep this in mind. Why do you and I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? The reason you and I believe that Jesus rose from the dead is because of the apostles' testimony. You remember Jesus prayed in John 17, verses 20 and 21, My prayer is not for them alone, that is for the apostles alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So you and I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead because of the testimony of the apostles, but here is Thomas refusing to believe the testimony of the apostles. And he said, unless I see him with my own eyes, I won't believe. Well, we're told, John 20, verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again. So this is the next uh, Sunday. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here in my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. 
By the way, these two passages here, uh, that is John 20, verse 25, and John uh, 20, verse 27, this is why we believe Jesus was nailed to the cross. You know, oftentimes people were put on the cross, they were tied to the cross, not nailed to the cross. Uh, and, and some argued that uh, if someone were nailed to the cross, that the uh, bones in the, in the hands and the arm, which, which by the way, well, and this is, I'm going over a little bit. This is a little bit superfluous information, but in Greek, the word for hand is care. And, and the word hand, care, it doesn't just refer to this, but rather it refers to this whole region. For instance, in Acts 12, when uh, Peter was, was chained in prison, when Herod Agrippa I was planning on uh, executing him the next day, and the angel came and performed a sanctified jailbreak and let Peter out, we're told that the, the chains fell from his hands. The word there is care. Well, nobody had chains on their hands. The chains would be on their wrists. But here the wrist region was known as the care. It's known as the hand. So Jesus, uh, Jesus when he was nailed to the cross, the nail didn't go in his hand, the nail probably went in his wrist. But some people disputed the idea that someone would be nailed to the cross because they would say those bones wouldn't be strong enough. Now we've got archaeological proof that people were nailed to the cross, but, but at any rate, uh, and i got to limit my comments here because they're superfluous to the task at hand, but uh, uh, this passage is the reason we believe that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Well, and there's also one passage in Colossians 2.14 that talks about the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that he nailed it to the cross. But, but at any rate, this is the direct reference to Jesus being nailed to the cross. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Jesus challenges Thomas. Okay, put your finger here in my hands. Reach your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting but believe. You see, Jesus, uh, Jesus wasn't raised in, a, in a, a different body than which he was crucified. He was raised physically. He was raised in the same body in which he was crucified. Now that uh, the substance of that body would be transformed probably after this point in time. Uh, it would be transformed. But Jesus was physically raised. And this Jesus' physical resurrection, that's the basis for us saying that the same body in which, we're die, in which we die is the same body that's going to be resurrected. Uh, you know, granted the... Um, uh, it may decay and it may go back to the dust of the earth, but, you know, God who formed man from the dust of the earth is able to reform man from the dust of the earth. He knows where all the particles are. All right, but, but anyway, Jesus, Jesus challenges Thomas. Okay, you know, stop doubting, believe. Examine me and see. That's what it, you said it would take for you to believe. Examine me and see. Now, I'm spending time on this because there, there's an important point to make. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. He stopped doubting. He believes. And his statement is significant. My Lord and my God. John begins by saying, In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now uh, Thomas confesses that Jesus is God incarnate. And then notice what Jesus says, verse 29. Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, that's you and me, who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, we've done what Thomas wouldn't do. Thomas would not believe the apostolic testimony. He said, unless I see, I won't believe. But we believe the apostolic testimony. And so we're more blessed, according to Jesus and our faith, than what Thomas was. All right, uh, last reference to Thomas in John's Gospel account. So there are four is John 21. He was present at Jesus' third appearance because he's in that list, verse 2, of uh, those who went with um, uh, Peter fishing. All right, well, uh, 44 minutes. I've gone over. Uh, Lord willing, next week we'll pick up by noticing uh, verse 18 of Mark 3, James, son of Alphaeus. And there's something interesting to say about James, son of Alphaeus. Well, I appreciate your patience and your attention. God bless you. We thank you for taking the time to worship with us and to study a portion of God's Word. We pray that this has been an edifying experience and that you would join us again. 
Now, if at any point during the lesson you had some questions, please feel free to email us at mhysaw at metaview.org. The email is both on the screen and in the description below. It is our goal to answer every Bible question with a Bible answer, to speak where the Bible speaks, and to be silent where it is silent. God bless you. We love you.